name is Tara Moore, and this is the Venus Flytrap Champion Series. This is the third in the series, so we've had two already. So if you were not able to watch those, we will definitely send you over links for those after because they were wonderful. Um, in this one, we will have Jeff and Scott as our speakers. Um, I'll turn it over to Julie Moore, and she will get us rolling with our presentation today. Thank you all. It's amazing how many names I see popping up on this call from our other earlier calls and also just friends of uh, the friends of the fly trap. I'm Julie Moore and I'm a retired wildlife endangered species biologist. I guess that's the best title I can use. Both the fellows are going to speak to us today, Scott and Jeff. I've worked for both of their organizations. I worked with the North Carolina Natural Heritage Program uh, many years ago and got very familiar with North Carolina before I migrated around the south. And I'm glad to be back in North Carolina. There's so many unusual and uh, valuable natural features of the state. What we're going to talk about today is Venus flytraps. And I've been interested in flytraps since I was in graduate school here. And to watch their demise has been one of the most uh, unnerving things. We've lost a lot of species and a lot of habitat. But what's happening in our coastal area, because it's so popular with development, we're losing more and more habitat. As Leslie Stark pointed out, and also Andy Wood last week, we'll learn more about management of these species. And it takes burning. And burning upsets people. And it really is, we need support for burning all over the state of North Carolina. And that is one of the things, in addition to habitat loss, is also the issue of uh, getting fire on the landscape. Well, in this effort for fly traps, we have a lot of cooperators. This is a, something that I hope is a coalition of organizations and agencies that are interested in fly traps. Some own land, some help people manage land. Uh, the heritage program that you'll hear from Scott about keeps records on all these unusual species, including the Venus fly trap. So we're going to go ahead and get started with Scott's presentation and then followed by Jeff. So Scott works for the Natural North Carolina Natural Heritage Program, and he'll tell you all about that wonderful organization that I enjoyed working for for many years. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Julie, and thanks everybody for having me. So I am going to talk about the Natural Heritage Program, and a big part of my focus is going to be on the partnerships. So. Um, I'm um, going to jump right in and give a quick outline of my presentation. I'm going to go and talk a little bit about the Natural Heritage Program, what it is we do. And for today's talk, I am going to emphasize rare species, but the program itself actually has a two-pronged approach to conservation. We do uh, maintain a database for rare species locations, but we also really emphasize high quality natural habitats and thinking of those as a coarse filter approach to conservation. If you protect these high quality habitats, you should be able to protect all the associated rare plants and animals as well, and common ones that we don't even know about. I will talk about Venus flytrap ecology, in particular the natural communities associated with Venus flytrap. I'm also gonna highlight some other species found only in the same range as Venus flytrap. Um, uh, I will try to talk about how flytraps fit into the bigger longleaf picture. And then uh, the last thing I'll do before I turn it over to Jeff is talk about threats to the habitat. So I am going to apologize for some redundancy with earlier talks, but I'm, we'll talk a little bit about the Natural Heritage Program. Uh, we are a non-regulatory program in, in the state government. We're in the Department of Natural and Cultural Resources. And we're small and we and do... Oh, we do three things. Uh, one of those is, you know, collect information. Uh, another is to maintain a database. And the last thing we do is to facilitate protection by sharing that information. Um, and the information is used in a number of different ways. It's used for um, certification programs, screening for threat and endangered species, environmental consultants use the data, and also for conservation funding. So where do we get all this information? Well, this is the first emphasis on partnerships uh, for my talk. We get this information from a lot of different partners. Um, some of our partners in the state and federal agencies, uh, the environmental consultant community, uh, the museum, herbariums, herbaria, uh, general naturalists, uh, as well as industry and utilities, and then the heritage program staff um, also most, well, about half of us are biologists and the other half are data managers. 
Uh, I'm only going to go through the first and sixth bullets of this slide, so I'm going to show this slide twice. But the first thing that we do, the sort of the backbone of our conservation work, is to identify conservation targets. And when I say targets, I'm talking about again, um, you know, rare species locations or high quality habitats, and we give them a rank. And this is not just us. This is a system developed over the years by the Natural Heritage Network, and it's consistent across Canada, uh, well, North America, Canada, on into, into Latin America. And we have these global ranks, G ranks, and then the subnational or state ranks. Uh, and this is a way that's a shorthand to convey how rare something is. So something that is G1 or S1, those are factored in on the number of populations as well as the threat or trend to those um, species. But something that's G1, our shorthand way of conveying that information is there's only one to five known populations globally. Something that's S1 or state rank one, it would be you know one to five known populations in the state. And the other end of that scale is this G5 or S5, things that are you know known to be secure, things like red maple or copperhead. So I'm going to give some examples of these different things to help uh, sort of convey this uh, this G rank and S rank system. So Venus flytraps, the thing we're talking about today, uh, are G2, S2. So you know you could think of this as six to twenty known populations known in the world, uh, and then. Um, the Venus flytrap cutworm moth, which I think Laura Heyman referenced in her talk, uh, actually is G1 S1. So it's even rarer than Venus flytraps themselves. Uh, and one thing to note is that sometimes the status of these animals, like their regulatory status, doesn't really match up as well to their uh, rarity, if you will. Uh, so like for red cagata woodpecker, which is S2 G3, um, it's a state and federally endangered animal, but maybe not quite as rare as some of the other 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 animals that we know about. And then the purple fringeless orchid is a good example of one that is rare in North Carolina than it is globally. So it's S2, it's really rare in North Carolina. We don't have many populations of it, but it's known from other places. And so it's relatively secure throughout the globe. And if you want to know uh, what plants and animals that we are tracking as rare, you can get that information from our website. And so you just download the rare animal list or the rare plant list. And this is really a great way to use this information because you can just use control F right on the screen and search for what you're looking for. So the other side of this, after we identify those conservation targets, those rare species, we do a lot of mapping. We do a lot of assigning of element occurrence ranks. We map natural areas, which look for the best of the best, the most viable of these element occurrences. And we try to prioritize conservation. And then our program does have two conservation agreements that we work with um, partners, again, since we don't own any land. Um, the registry and the dedication, and Julie asked me to, to note these really quickly. The registry is a voluntary non-binding agreement and we do provide some management recommendations about how to protect the natural heritage resource values on a property. Dedicated nature preserves are more similar to a conservation easement. Um, it's an agreement that is attached to the land or runs with the land, and it requires approval of council of state and governor, and it has specific management rules to uh, protect the public benefits. But again, the Natural Heritage Program doesn't own or manage land and partnerships are critical to what we do. So we provide information to facilitate conservation. And this is a, a photo from a, a day with the Natural Heritage Program and Nature Conservancy staff on one of the TNC preserves. Um, but if you're interested in getting some of this information or access to this information, um, going to our website is the place to go. And I'm going to go through this quickly um, on this screen, which is the this is kind of the splash page for our program. You can get right to the Data Explorer, and that's where the red arrow is. And if you open up the Data Explorer or if you click on the Data Explorer, you get this page, which has the arrow for the map. And I'm going to show you the map, but I'm also going to show you the a little bit to the right of the red arrow, there's another tab that says Species Community Search. That's another way to get information from the National Heritage Program. So the, the website is a great tool to, um, to use to get information. So this is the map when you open up the map and you can see all these um, uh, 
topics on the left. You could uh, click on one of those and it would show up on the map. And then you can click on the polygons within that field and it would give you information. So here's a uh, Masonboro Island, which is a coastal reserve. That's also a dedicated nature preserve. And then I mentioned the species community search. So if you were interested in knowing which county's Venus flytrap occurs in, you would just type it in here where someone has typed in already, Venus flytrap under common name, and you'll get a list by county of all the counties where Venus flytrap occurs or has occurred historically. So you can see um, 18 counties where the flytrap has occurred in North Carolina. Some of those are historical, so the, there's a map. You can click on the a map link here too as well. Um, that shows that the counties where we currently know or Venus flytraps occur, and then the red counties are the counties that were known historically to occur. And I wanted to use this map to sort of jump into the importance of this part of the world, not just for Venus flytraps, but for a, a lot of other um, biodiversity as well. And this is a map some people have probably seen before with these hot spots of biodiversity. So uh, this is um, the US and Hawaii. You can see a lot of, you know, a lot of these spots occur in the West and in Florida and the Appalachians, but in the Southeastern North Carolina, you see one of these hotspots. And this is a, a corresponds to a geologic feature we call the Cape Fear Arch. And this represents an area of high endemism and biodiversity. And I'm saying endemism, uh, things that are endemic are uh, native and restricted to a certain place. And I have a star here on this because I we use natural heritage data to sort of make this table. So there are a, a lot of plants and animals that are endemic to the Cape Fear Arch. I'm qualifying it because in the case of Venus flytrap, there are still some remnant populations at Fort Bragg, which is technically in the Sandhills, so technically not in the Cape Fear Arch. But the, the majority are, uh, of, or in some cases, all of the known populations of these plants are in the Cape Fear Arch. And uh, I know this is quite a list, but I did want to note, uh, here are the uh, S ranks and G ranks. So you can see in this case, there are some S1s, S2s, S3s. Uh, <clears throat> so things that are less rare, you know, but still they're, they're only known in the world from this, you know, from uh, Cape Fear Arch. Things that are G1 are really, really, quite rare and you know this is the only place in the world they're known to occur. So I know those tables are hard to read and I apologize for that. So I'm just going to show you some pictures of them instead. Uh, this is Savannah indigo bush. This is one of those plants on that list. Uh, grows in longleaf pine savannas on loamy soils. Uh, only 40 populations known in the world. 38 of those are in North Carolina. Uh, we've lost a few of those. Uh, they've either uh, been destroyed or the plants haven't been seen in those spots for the last few, or what, 20 years, over 20 years. But we have 35 extant populations or currently known to exist populations. Uh, and then there are two populations in South Carolina. I should point out on this plant, not only is it confined sort of just to the Cape Fear Arch, in North Carolina, it's really only in two counties, uh, Brunswick and Columbus County. So it's quite rare. And also, uh, like Julie noted, it's also fire adapted, so it requires that that open habitat. Uh, two more on that list, savanna onion, um, found in wet, fine, uh, wet pine savanna habitat, uh, only known from North Carolina right now. We have about 12 populations. Um, and uh, it's also uh, in that uh, pine savanna habitat, but only over uh, Coquina limestone, so it's a little bit restricted in its habitat as well. And then another plant which does not have the charisma of the Venus flytrap, and that is this thin wall quillwort. Uh, only known, or only 10 populations are known in the world, uh, and they're all in North Carolina. Uh, this is a, a plant, and I'm putting this on here, not, uh, not because it's charismatic, but I was going to point out that this is a plant that we're actually doing a status assessment this year. And there's a biologist who might be contacting landowners this year to, to, to get access to some of these Blackwater floodplains to see if that plant is on their property. And I don't know who all is on the, on the talk, but they might be contacted. Uh, this plant is really interesting. And one of the things that's really interesting about it is it looks like a grass, but it's actually more closely related to ferns. This produces spores. So it's not charismatic, but it's neat. Uh, anyway, 
So another uh, really big table, uh, hard to read. I'm apologizing for that. But again, animals endemic to the Cape Fear Arch. In this case, what I would point out is there are almost all of these animals are S1, G1. In some cases, they're S1, G2 or something. But uh, what this really is saying is that if you're going to conserve these animals, there's only one place in the world to do it, and that's in this area. It has to be southeastern North Carolina and a little bit of South Carolina, because this is the only place they occur. All our eggs are in one basket. Uh, I have a couple of pictures of these animals, or some of these animals. One is the Carolina pygmy sunfish, which occurs only in North Carolina and South Carolina. And then the Waccamaw spike. And, uh, these are all, and I should have pointed out, this Lake Waccamaw, Waccamaw River corridor is really important for aquatics. Um, and the other thing I wanted to point out with this uh, picture, this Waccamaw spike, um, this was part of a biological survey. This is sort of a public service announcement. This is part of a biological survey. Actually, uh, we would ask people to be careful with these. You know, there are very few of these animals left in the world. Um, and so uh, disturbing them, in their habitat, They're, they can't really go anywhere. Um, so try to leave them where they are if you can, because you know handling them can actually uh, negatively impact them. So you know picking up shells that are dead or whatever is is fine, but we'd ask you to leave the live the live animals alone if you would please. All right, getting back to the Venus flytrap, it's currently at or yeah, it's it's currently the status is currently being assessed whether it's going to be listed federally. Uh, in North Carolina, it's currently special concern, but as of May 2021, will be uh, listed as threatened in North Carolina. And it's G2S2, so it's quite rare. Uh, it does co-occur with a lot of, or quite a few protected species. Some of them um, are known only from the Cape Fear Arch, like Golden Sedge. Some like red-cutted wood, red woodpecker, uh, their range extends you know, pretty far in the southeastern United States. Where do these, uh, where do you find Venus flytraps? Um, I'm sure you've seen lots of pictures like this already. This is a wet pine savanna. Uh, you can see the Venus flytrap flowers, not the, not the, um, not the racemes here, but these little white dots throughout here. Those are Venus flytrap flowers. So it occurs in wet pine savannas and peatland pocosins, and sometimes sort of on the edge of those two habitats. So this photo shows in the front, sort of these upland, sort of sandier soils, and then where the ferns are, you're getting into more of a uh, uh, organic soil. And uh, but it's still fire. Well, I should say it's open habitat is key to the Venus flytrap and a lot of other plants that use this uh, transition area, this ecotone between the uh, upland savannas and, and the peatland pocosins. Uh, and the way we uh, would prefer and naturally that w these habitats would have been kept open is like Julie mentioned through uh, fire uh, really uh, emphasizing frequent and low intensity fire. And when I say frequent, I mean like one to three year return intervals. And low intensity is kind of referring to the flame length here, you know, where the flames are low enough to the ground where they burn up the pine needles and hopefully restore or knock back some of the mid story. But the flames aren't tall enough to reach up and, and get these um, get the terminal buds in these rocket stage longleaf pines or candle stage, however you call them. So fire is really important. So fire suppression is one of the threats to longleaf pine savanna, as well as um, and I, I know other speakers have mentioned hydrological alteration or drainage, uh, road maintenance development. Uh, forestry and agriculture, I'm in there, I'm talking about conversion of natural forests to, you know, single species pine plantations or even to cropland, um, which has happened. Uh, and sometimes pine, pine straw raking, other aspects of forestry can be have a pretty heavy impact on, on the herb layer ecosystems. Uh, and then invasive exotic species, I'm putting a question mark. Uh, we're keeping an eye on a plant to the south that uh, cook on grass which has the potential to really um, impact these systems. Um, so uh, we're we've got a question mark, but for now, I basically using the same slide again to note that the threats to the Venus flytrap are the same. I'm adding, you know, poaching or over collection. But the point I'm trying to make is that we really don't, uh, well, our, I would recommend, or we would recommend that people wouldn't focus on a single species in their management approach. They really focus on the overall system. Uh, you know, in the longleaf pine ecosystem in their management. 
And Jeff is going to talk about the different uh, threats and partnerships and, and management. So um, I'm going to almost end my talk right now with a sort of a note. You know, we would appreciate help from folks to keep records updated. Um, you know, if you're making observations of some of these rare species, uh, I know um, earlier talks I mentioned pygmy rattlesnake, uh, mimic glass lizard. If you are making uh, observations of these and you know, get them to the museum or to us, we would appreciate it. And that'll get in the database and help us, um, you know, provide that information to others. And then visits to dedicated nature preserves and registered areas, registered heritage areas. And with that, I'm going to end my talk and turn it over to Jeff. Any any points, Julie, while I do this? Yes, I'd like to mention uh, two things. One is when this idea of recognizing Venus flytrap champions came about, it was really based on my experience years ago with the North Carolina Natural Heritage Registry. We learned early on that just because we know where unusual things are and a state agency does, doesn't mean that the landowners necessarily know what they have. And sometimes they do, but for the most part they don't. And so part of what we're trying to do with the Venus flytrap champions, since we know a lot of these landowners now based on the uh, inventory work that was done the last two years, is to really help landowners understand what they have and what the management needs are. And that's what we started with the heritage program years ago with the registry program. So this recognition of landowners and good managers really it comes out of my experience and other people's experience with working with landowners without acquiring their land. I, I firmly believe that there's a role for the private landowner in conservation, but they need to know what to do and where to do it and when to do it. So part of our project uh, will be reaching out to the landowners and managers uh, who have flytrap either populations or really good uh, potential for those populations. So it's um, it will be an outreach program to these people. And you all may know landowners who have fly traps or good, I'll just say, a good habitat that may have fly traps that haven't been seen in a while because the shrubs have um, shaded the ground. So there are um, different ways we can encourage landowners. And that's what I hope our a Venus Flytrap Champions program will do as we move forward. And some of you all, I hope, can help us be advocates with meeting these landowners because uh, it, it takes uh, neighbors to encourage people in many cases. When scientists arrive from the Fish and Wildlife Service or the state, sometimes we're, we're not the best, we're, we're not necessarily the best well received. Uh, let's put it that way. What I was glad that Scott was able to say is how Venus Flytraps pit fit into the bigger picture of conservation in southeastern North Carolina. And you did that very well. Flytrap is just the most charismatic thing that we have in that area. Uh, as much as I like quill worts, I don't think quill worts are going to inspire anybody. And uh, so the flytrap really is a, a signature species, or I guess we could say, oh, there's what's, what's another name for signature species? Well, anyway, it, uh, it gets people, flagship, that's it. Uh, it gets people interested in this bigger picture. And Scott, thank you for covering that. And Jeff now is gonna talk about the cooperation that goes on and who all's involved. He is uh, based in the Sand Hills and particularly works with um, Longleaf Pine Systems. And uh, he's the Longleaf Pine Applied Scientist working out of Southern Pines. So tell us what you wanna tell us, Jeff. Great, thanks. And Scott, I think you need to stop sharing your screen so I can start sharing mine. Okay. Did it stop? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, and let me you know, can you all see my presentation now? And it's not in presentation mode, but or it's been yeah, that looks mode. great. Okay. Great. So uh, yeah, my name is, is, is Jeff Marcus. I'm uh, applied scientist with the Nature Conservancy. And for those of you who've been tuning into uh, the, this webinar series about uh, the Venus Flytrap uh, champions, I've heard from, uh, from Johnny and Lauren and Leslie and Andy and now Scott about a lot of really cool and interesting dimensions of this. And you're probably starting to get an appreciation that if you're going to protect and conserve a species like this, you're going to need biologists who can go out and do the surveys, understand where they are, understand you know where they grow and what they need. You're going to need 
land managers who can who can put that fire on the ground and who can manage the property. Uh, you're going to need organizations that can 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 acquire and protect land where needed. Uh, you need folks that can work on policy, uh, putting in some of those uh, those laws and rules that you heard about earlier in the series. Um, and you need funders and, and money to to be able to do this. And so. Clearly, you know, there's a lot of different elements and pieces to, to, to the puzzle that, that need to come together. And that, that's where collaborations and partnerships can, can be really critical. So I wanted to touch today on just a few of those types of partnerships and how they work and how they operate to help protect uh, Venus flytrap in particular. So there, there's a number of different types of partnerships and I'll just kind of go around giving you just a few examples. This is not nearly an exhaustive list, but uh, there's formal conservation collaboratives like the Sandhills Conservation Partnership, Cape Fear Arch Conservation Collaborative. These groups bring together um, conservation organizations, provide a forum for people to discuss and share resources and information and, uh, and, and, and try to be more effective. Uh, there's some less traditional kinds of things like partnerships with the Department of Defense, kind of moving clockwise around here. Um, around Camp Lejeune and Fort Bragg, where we're meeting mutual interests, where the Army wants to see uh, land protected to uh, avoid encroachment on, on military training and avoid more endangered species, which might constrain development. And so uh, they find common cause with a number of conservation organizations. Um, other types of bilateral agreements like the Nature Conservancy and the Wildlife Resources Commission uh, have, have, a, have a resource sharing and other agencies and entities do this as well for particularly around fire and I'll talk about that a little bit more later. And then there's organizations like the North Carolina Longleaf Coalition that provide a bit of a, an umbrella and help promote policy. Uh, they were supportive of, of, the, of the Longleaf Honor Roll to help recognize uh, landowners and another uh, type of, of, of a program like, like the, uh, the Venus Flytrap Champions. So just, just a few examples of the kinds of partnerships that are out there and just want to kind of talk about how they address threats. So, so Scott did a nice job of laying out what a lot of the threats are and I'm going to touch on two of them that I think are, are, are some of the most significant and pernicious and then the first is just conversion of habitat. Um, this is a picture I took recently down in, in, in Brunswick County. Uh, if you've spent any time in southern Brunswick County lately, you're seeing that they're cutting down longleaf pine trees as fast as uh, fast as they can get to them and so uh, as Julie mentioned, there's 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 a role for, uh, for for private landowners and supporting private land work, but there's also is a role for for actually being able to 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 protect land through through buying it through uh, um, you know to 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 conserve it there uh, or using tools like conservation easements that allow uh, private landowners to keep land in place, but uh, alleviating some of the development threats and things. So, uh, example of, of 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 a place that's been protected, the McLean Savanna. Uh, that is a place that the Nature Conservancy purchased. This will no, never be developed and never be impacted in that type of way. Uh, but the way that land protection works actually takes a lot of collaboration and partnerships. So starting on the left of this image, you have the funders. There's a number of funding sources. Uh, um, highlight just a couple here. The North Carolina Land and Water Fund is a critical one. It's state appropriated dollars that go to uh, be used to 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 conserve in, in important uh, habitat areas and recreation opportunities. The Department of Defense already mentioned that provides funding through these different agreements. There are other sources, um, but being able to kind of support and encourage more funding is is a key piece that 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 some arms of these partnerships will will, will do. And organizations like Sentinel Landscapes that advocate for for more funding. Uh, and then there's a role for once you have that money available. You need people that have the relationships with the landowners and the capacity to to go out and, and make land deals happen. So that's a critical role for land trust like Coastal Land Trust and the Nature Conservancy operate within the, the range of Venus flytrap. And um, these these organizations have staff that that again can 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 do all that work from really developing those those relationships, coming to agreements with with landowners on a voluntary basis and closing these deals. Uh, but a, but a, another sort of critical part of this is that some of these lands that the Nature Conservancy Coastal Land Trust protect will, will remain either in private ownership with, with an easement on them or uh, owned by these, these land trusts and managed, but some will then be in turn transferred to uh, different public agencies like state parks and the Wildlife Resources Commission, which increases the capacity for management um, so that uh, these, these places can be managed long term. 
uh, with using the resource of these agencies and also provide for public access so the public can enjoy and get the benefits from these, uh, the, these great places. So as you can see, there's a lot of partners and a lot of, uh, of, of, of elements to, to making a land deal come together. Um, next threat I wanna talk about is the lack of fire or appropriate management. Uh, Scott showed a nice picture of a transition zone, the ecotone between the uplands and, and the wetlands that, uh, um, you know, that are nicely managed with fire. Well, if you don't manage it, it, it looks something a little bit more like this. So basically just a thick wall of evergreen shrub and green briar and uh, just really dense vegetation that, that can shade out a lot of the more sensitive uh, plants like the Venus flytrap that would otherwise grow there. And so fire is the primary tool. Now there's other tools that, uh, that, that, that can be used. Mowing is, uh, is, is one, other types of mechanical disturbance, but fire is, 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 is the preferred method to, uh, to, to, to carry across to knock back those shrubs and open it up and transition it from this really dense evergreen, you know, shrub community to to a more of an open um, zone that supports uh, just a tremendous diversity of these of these rare plants and other other carnivorous plants. In order to make a fire happen, uh, just like a land protection deal, takes a lot of things. Uh, putting putting a fire on the ground takes a lot of parts. You need the right people, the right training, the right equipment, the right uh, you know weather conditions, the right policies in place, and for any one organization to be able to have all of these 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 elements at the scale that they need has been a challenge. And so for the longest time, each individual organization was doing their best and trying to get as much fire on the ground. And over the past decade or two, uh, the Nature Conservancy has been helping to, to, to kind of move that model to, to, to more of a shared resource model to where um, we can get, so for instance, the Nature Conservancy has been getting funding through the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation and other sources to hire these burn crews of highly skilled um, firefighters. A lot of these folks that, that, that spend their summers going out west to fight Western wildfires will come in, 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 the, in, the, in the winter and spring and, 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 and do fire here. And they will burn not only on TNC properties, but also will help our state partners, the Wildlife Resources Commission, uh, Plant Conservation Program, the uh, um, state parks and others uh, um, to, 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 to provide this personnel and manpower that's needed. In turn, there's a sharing of uh, the Nature Conservancy doesn't have big heavy equipment like dozers and, and, and uh, um, other things that are needed to put in fire lines or help protect sometimes. And so an agency like Wildlife Resources can provide those types of, 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 of support. So by sharing these resources and really looking at what are the bigger needs across the entire landscape, we're being more effective on getting fire on the ground on any given day. And that's important, not just for these, 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 these conservation lands, the, 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 the preserves and parks and, and, and game lands and such, uh, but also on private lands as well. Private landowners uh, need to do fire and, and they, they can't be expected to get the kind of training and equipment and, and support that, that, that they need to do to things to the level uh, that you see on a lot of our public lands. And filling that need has been uh, organizations called prescribed burn associations or PBAs. Uh, there's one in the Sand Hills, another in the uh, Cape Fear Arch region, <coughs> um, and, and based out of you know centered around Bladen Lakes. And basically, this is kind of uses a neighbors helping neighbors approach, based on the old sort of barn raising philosophy. That uh, you know, if you're a landowner that uh, needs uh, some 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 more help from from other people to pull off a burn on your property, and there's someone else who's looking to get more experience with putting fire on the ground, the PBAs help sort of put these people together so that um, these, these, these landowners can be learning from each other and from natural resource professionals and again, sharing those resources to get work done. Uh, these PBAs provide easy access to, to, to assistance. Uh, so there'll be uh, a, uh, what, what um, Jesse Wimberly from the Sandhills PBA is dubbed uh, Longleaf Speed Dating events where uh, private landowners can come to an event where there's representatives from North Carolina Forest Service and the Land Trust and from NRCS uh, for, 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 for funding and uh, uh, Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program and all these different partners who are there. So if a landowner says, well, 
I'd like to do something, but I need a management plan. Okay, we plug in with this person. And well, someone else says, well, I'd like to do something, but I need funding. I don't have the money to be able to do it. Well, we can put you in, in touch with the right person who can help provide that cost share. So um, that's a role. Uh, these, these PBAs provide uh, training sessions, equipment, and, and mentors. Uh, these are retired professionals who can sit down with a landowner and help them to write that burn plan, help them to understand the weather, uh, fire lines, everything they need to do to more safely and effectively put fire on the ground. So I've been talking about what sort of is happening in landscape, what are these partnerships and these types of things, but I wanted to pull this around to how you can be part of this partnership. Um, part of these 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 different efforts, and I see on this call there's there's a wide range of, of, of people, some folks from natural resource agencies who are already very much plugged into this, other uh, uh, wildlife federation members, and, and 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 folks who maybe aren't biologists and aren't fire practitioners, aren't land managers, and may or may not see a a, a role or a place for yourself in this. And I'd like to maybe point out uh, a, a few few things to consider. So. These groups that are doing this work, there's great ways that you can support them. Become a member, donate, do this type of thing. The land trusts that we talked about all uh, have, have, have memberships that, that uh, you know, greatly appreciate that type of support, TNC and Coastal Land Trust. Uh, Friends of Plant Conservation and the NC Botanical Garden have, have membership and these organizations raise funds and, and support for uh, the important plant conservation work of, uh, of uh, um, the plant conservation program and the Bach Garden. Um, we're still in tax season. They extended our tax deadline to May uh, 15th. Those of you still uh, filing your taxes might see at the end, if you're getting a refund, an option to uh, check off for the non-game and endangered uh, wildlife fund. And that money goes to fund uh, biologists with the Wildlife Resources Commission who do great work. Um, and it's a great and easy way to, to support that kind of thing. NC Wildlife Federation is, is a key partner. These uh, This webinar series that you've been part of have been all sponsored by uh, uh, NWF and they get involved in policy and advocacy and a lot of great other other areas and the North Carolina Prescribed Fire Council uh, is a group that's focused a lot on supporting more of the, the 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 professionals and resource agencies but also private landowners who who have an interest in fire and, and are looking for for different ways of support. Another way you can get involved is contacting your elected officials elected, elected representatives and really promoting better policy and in this slide, I've called out just just a, just one example from each of the various levels of, of government. There's, of course, lots of different kind of policy issues and questions that are that are out there that that, that deserve attention. But I wanted to just highlight just uh, at least one each level. So at the federal level, there's the Recovering America's Wildlife Act, sometimes called RAWA. This would be a game changer in terms of providing significant dedicated funding for non-game wildlife uh, um, conservation, supporting uh, implementation of state wildlife action plans, and some new uh, legislation that would allow money from that to also be used to, to support rare plants like the Venus flytraps. So that would uh, by, increase by an order of magnitude the amount of money that comes in annually to support that type of work. Uh, at the state level, I've already mentioned the Land and Water Conservation Fund. This is uh, done by the, the, the uh, money is put there by the state uh, annual appropriation process. And, and depending on the, the li um, level of interest and priorities of the current uh, legislature and, and, and governor, uh, the, the, the funding levels vary. They're lower than they had been historically, have been creeping back up, and this is a key thing. So again, promoting the use of that. And at the local level, uh, promoting the use of the green growth toolbox. And for those of you who may not be familiar with the green growth toolbox, um, thought I'd just sort of provide a quick overview. This is essentially trying to get, you know, land, you know, a lot of development, the patterns of development are controlled at the local level by local government policy and land use planners and, and, and planning documents. And those planners don't tend to be biologists and don't tend to have the, 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 the knowledge the, and information and access to information for, you know, understanding how those patterns of development affect um, habitat and, and, and wildlife. And so Green Growth Toolbox is actually going to provide the conservation data to these local governments and train their staff on how to uh, how, how to interpret them and how to use them. So it provides that training for the planners. Uh, it's a document that provides recommendations to uh, how to incorporate these principles into land use plans and ordinances, provides some model ordinances and incentive 
programs that local governments can use. And then there's even funding that can be available to your local government through the Partners for Green Growth project program um, to help them implement. So uh, it's, it, it's a great resource wherever you are, whether you're in the range of fly traps or not, this is something that can be done to protect the resources in your local community. If you're a landowner out there, um, again, wide range, some, some landowners who are been well steeped in, in, uh, in, in, in managing their land are very familiar and, and maybe just need some extra you know, resource of support. Others who may be for, new to the, to the land ownership game and, and, and need to learn more. So uh, wherever you are on that spectrum, spectrum few tips uh, or, or ideas here, you know, take the time to learn about the natural communities that currently occur, occur or that would have naturally occurred on your property. Sometimes, you know, when you, you, you have a property or you get a piece of land, it, it, it looks different than what it did or could with, with, with appropriate management. And it can be hard to see to get that vision for what that place could be. Um, so, so really having the chance to learn more about what the potential of that property is. And there is technical guidance to help with that. Uh, Folks like John and Shear on this call, uh, Partner for Fish and Wildlife, technical experts with the Wildlife Resources Commission, Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, um, NC Forest Service, and others are there to help you to 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 better understand your resources and, and and what management can look like. If you don't have a management plan, that's key. If you don't have a plan, you know it's hard to get to where you're going without a plan to get there. Um, if funding is an obstacle, cost share is available through a variety of different programs and be happy to talk about some of those if those are interested. Uh, set yourself some achievable milestones and, and relish the small victories in the journey. Understand that it's not an instantaneous um, thing. You know, restoring habitat and maintaining habitat takes years and indeed decades to get to there. And so um, Understanding where you're getting to and understanding those milestones as you're as you're going along the way can be important to not get discouraged that it's not just going to happen all at once. And uh, bottom line, strive to become a Venus flytrap champion. Uh, you know, these these are the landowners who are doing the good work to support Venus flytraps. And if you can aspire to uh, to qualify for that program, that's uh, that's fantastic. There's opportunities to volunteer your time. So the Nature Conservancy uh, has volunteers that help with wiregrass and longleaf planting. Uh, the Wildlife Federation uh, and particularly the local chapters of, of, of uh, Wildlife Federation have a variety of different work days and events and opportunities to, to, to get dirt under your fingernails and, and, and help make some things happen. And there's also citizen science projects. Uh, iNaturalist is a really easy one. You download this app, you take pictures of things that you see and uh, it uploads it and it contributes that information to our, our knowledge of the distribution and status. Uh, other projects that are out there calling amphibian survey project, NC bird atlas aren't obviously directly connected to, to Venus flytraps, but uh, help us with that broader understanding of the whole system as, as, as Scott and Julie and others have referred to that we're really trying to, to, to protect a system, not just a plant. And finally, just just whoever you are, regardless of your wildlife, uh, man, you know, a manager, a professional, or, or a novice, take the time to appreciate and enjoy the fact that the North Carolina supports one of the most unique and fascinating biological treasures on the planet, meaning the Venus flytrap and the whole longleaf ecosystem. We don't always appreciate that that this is a unique, not just for where we are in North Carolina, but 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 on planet Earth, there's 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 some of the greatest places you can go to see some of these really unique things. So um, ways to do that, go see some fly traps and take someone who's never seen them before. Uh, an excellent place is the, is the TNC's Green Swamp Preserve in Brunswick County, open to the public, uh, easily accessible trails that you can, can, can walk down and, uh, and see the fly traps. Over the next month or so, they're gonna start blooming, real easy to, to get to see them. Um, just get out there and appreciate them. You can strut your love of flytraps by uh, getting a Venus flytrap license plate. Uh, the Botanical Garden website is down here. You can uh, go on there if that passes and comes through. You'll be able to uh, drive around showing people that you love flytraps. And another great way is, is to attend the Fire in the Pines Festival. Uh, it happens in the, in the fall, October of each year. Uh, we hope to be back to an in-person festival uh, in, in, in 2021 in Wilmington. You'll be able to see flytraps, be able to uh, um, hear about lots of different kinds of conservation efforts. And again, you see a, a website down at the bottom that you can check out some great videos and info uh, um, that was put together from this last year. And with that, I think I will we'll leave it and allow uh, some opportunity for, uh, for some questions and discussion. 
Jeff, that was wonderful. Yes, thank Carol, you so you much. Answer? Yes, thank you so much, Jeff and Scott. That was amazing. Um, we learned a ton and I'm, I'm very inspired. Um, so if anyone has questions, there are two ways to ask questions. You can put your question in the chat box, um, which is the conversation blurb in the top right hand corner, or you can raise your hand. So feel free to ask your questions now. We have we have a few minutes um, in case anyone has some good questions. We have a question from Daniel Hannon, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Yeah, hi. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I just had a quick question. Uh, so I, I was doing the Venus flytrap surveys for natural heritage program last summer on the private lands. And so I came across a lot of existing records, existing natural heritage records where, you know, either the habitat was still marginal, but there was no fly traps found, or we just, you know, the habitat was good and there was no fly traps found. And some of the landowners expressed interest in having fly traps back on their property and managing for fly traps, but they just, you know, either they just don't have fly traps there anymore. And I was just wondering, is there a resource or is there some sort of strategy anyone's thinking of for trying to put propagated fly traps back on the landscape or, or is it sort of just expecting natural management to facilitate their sort of reoccurrence in historical or EOs, element occurrences that are, that are no longer showing as being there? May I address that question? <laughs> yeah, please do. <laughs> uh, the uh, North Carolina Botanical Garden has a good collection of uh, from populations all across the range of fly traps. And with encouragement and some funding, I do believe that they will be willing to propagate some of those populations from specific areas uh, so that we could start that program for those landowners who are really serious about wanting to reintroduce fly traps. The other thing is a possibility of using seeds uh, rather than growing the plants that you could actually, uh, depending on the quality of your habitat, you could actually reseed directly. So I think we're definite. I know we're looking into possibilities and you've met the right people by your work. And I think that's so important is to find those people who are interested. And sometimes if they start burning enough, you're going to be surprised what's going to show up. After, even though you think something isn't there any longer, uh, they will appear occasionally. Uh, on the landscape because those seed, some species seed bank better than others. But I, we will take your recommendation and see where we can go with that. And well, we'll let the botanical I, garden know there's an interest. Can I, can I respond to that too, Julie? Because I, I see Leslie Starks on the call and other folks from Plant Conservation Program. And because it will be a listed species, I do want to advise caution and make sure you coordinate with the Plant Conservation Program before before anyone starts moving species around, we really want to have in situ conservation, but we want to make sure we know which populations are experimental. And yeah, I see Leslie's un unmuted her mic, so I'll let her jump in. Thanks, Scott. I was trying to type in the chat and figure out how to unmute myself and all of that as you were going. <laughs> so that was a great lead in, but absolutely. Um, the plant conservation program, um, you know, we are the ones that list species like Venus flytraps for the state. And um, then we're the ones that enforce the regulations that actually provide the protection for the things on the list so that they are, you know, protected species. And one of those things is to help us keep track of plant populations that are being created and those that are being destroyed. And we work really closely with the Heritage Program, like Scott's talking about, for that documentation um, to plant listed species into non-garden environments. Uh, you would need a permit from our um, program. And we have a permit review committee that, you know, Here's these uh, proposals and and weighs in with what will be hopefully the best outcomes for the species conservation as a whole. So feel free to reach out to our uh, program, ncplant.com. I don't know how we got that short link uh, of all the people in the state that care about plants. That'll get you to our website and you can learn more about applying for a permit. I'm gonna Thank say you. thanks for the question, Dan. And just to point out for everyone who, uh, who had a chance to tune into the first uh, webinar in the series that a lot of the maps that Johnny Randall and Lauren uh, presented uh, included uh, data, you know, that, that that Dan had collected to help us to really better understand that uh, that distribution. So thanks for all your all your work in, in, in increasing our knowledge of the species. 
Tara, I'm seeing this question in the chat that might um, be one that I can respond to about yeah, sure. Go for it. Uh, landowner obligations in developing properties with listed species. So I don't think it's been covered in uh, elsewhere in these webinars, but since I was just talking about listed species and the regulations that protect them, I want to um, take it back a couple steps and explain that um, in the grand scheme of things, when you protect species by listing them under things like the Endangered Species Act or state laws um, of similar import, uh, animals and plants are treated very differently uh, just at the base level. So animals belong to all of us, essentially, but plants belong to the landowner where they grow. And so even um, though we do have quite a few regulations that allow us to provide some protection for uh, imperiled plant species in the state, um, none of those supersede the rights of the landowner and so um, it's not uncommon for people to call our office and say you know i'm seeing a for sale sign or a you know coming soon sign uh, where a lot's going to be developed and i know it has venus flytraps or other imperiled species on it like can you stop them <laughs> uh, more or less and the answer is no um the the law doesn't prohibit someone from destroying venus flytrap or any other listed species populations, which is why all of these um, um, volunteer and uh, non-mandatory, what's the word I'm looking for? The opposite of mandatory is? Regulatory. Regulatory. Uh, <laughs> I can't I think, think of the word, like but optional? you know where optional? I'm going. Um, so um, I'm sorry. Well, anyway, insert word here. Um, these programs that get, you know, both agencies and private landowners and, you know, uh, private organizations together for conserving flytraps and their habitats are so critical because for all the regulations we do have, nothing actually stops a landowner from destroying these populations. They belong to them. That was a great answer. Thank you so much for covering that. Um, and it's great having now four kind of experts on on the call to answer all these questions. So I, I love that. We did have someone ask how they could get a license plate um, if someone wants to cover that. Go to the North Carolina Botanical Garden website. We also have a website that's specific to um, Venus flytrap champions. It's Venus flytrap champions org and we have a tremendous amount of information on that including some on the about the license plate we have a management ideas we even have a fun page and we have lots of gorgeous pictures and it is to be an informative website and we can put a lot more on it if you have ideas we talk about historic research that's been done and research that's underway right now the thing about flytrap that fascinates me and other people is people have been enthusiastic about it for eons but there's not a whole lot known. And I think that's the odd thing is there's so many questions still about flytrap, uh, how they operate and not just the mechanism of trapping, but what their pollinators are, why the, why the, some of the traps are so red and why some of them are green. So we're still learning an awful lot about flytraps and our website tries to cover that. But the license, we'd love for you to get one. The quickest place is to go to the North Carolina Botanical Garden website and that money from that license plate will be split between the botanical garden and the plant conservation program. So that funding, uh, when it comes through, will be able, available to protect habitat. So that's an exciting uh, aspect of the plate. Plus, it's going to be really great looking on my red car. Yeah, uh, real quick, though, you would go on a waiting list because there isn't there is going to be a bill that goes to the General Assembly this year, we hope that authorizes this. But right now we have a, a waiting list and we have enough people that have you know, basically ordered the license plate, you know, to qualify, but it still has to be approved by the General Assembly. This is another place where Jeff's, you know, contacting your representative is a good thing to make sure that thing does go through the General Assembly. Very good point, Scott. Thank you, guys. Um, so we did have a question about a plant rescue that I think Leslie covered. Um, so if you guys want to go in the chat and just um, check about doing a rescue mission on property that is about to be developed um, that is covered. So thank you, Leslie. Rescues are possible. Um, and Michael Barnard also said he has a couple hundred flat traps in cultivation. He would be willing to donate the seeds from his plants in July if you're interested in using them. Um, 
So that is just to throw that out there that that, that was a comment in the chat. So thank you, Michael, for bringing that up. Um, and let's see, I don't see any other questions in the chat right now. Um, oh, yep, okay. So it looks like we have all of those covered. So thank you, team, for getting to those questions. Um, we have just four minutes left in the hour. So if anyone has any more pending questions, um, feel free to raise your hand or put the question in the chat and we can get to that before we end. Well, we can also take comments. There are a lot of knowledgeable people on this call today. And uh, if they would like to contribute, John Ann Shearer from the Fish and Wildlife Service, just all kinds of people. And a few real fanatics like uh, Debbie Crane and her efforts have gotten us a brochure for, for landowners to alert them who to call and how to get in contact with people if they have fly traps or think they do. And uh, that was designed by Sydney, um, I think, with the Nature Conservancy and the Fish and Wildlife Service is going to produce that. We have a variety of people that have helped get this project off the ground and uh, that's greatly appreciated. Um, and there are other ways to help. We had one of the people who just commented, I think, actually um, volunteered to post information elsewhere on this project. There are lots of different levels you can operate on to contribute to this uh, effort. So don't think too big, you can think small too. And um, my Sister wants to see, when she comes back to North Carolina, a billboard. And I haven't tackled that issue yet because when she saw one that said save the manatee in North Carolina, she didn't know why we couldn't have a save the flytrap billboard somewhere. Maybe like the license plate. So there are a lot of different ways we can work with flytraps. And I think both Jeff, uh, your details really gave a lot of ideas there. And Scott, how the process works of identifying critical areas. So you have to know what you're working on so you can be successful. And then you have to put the tools together. And I think we can all contribute to that on lots of different ways. Uh, and I hope you'll step forward if you have good ideas and uh, be a part of the pro be a part of the solution. Thank you, Julie. And we had a comment saying that someone has seen a Venus flytrap mural on the side of a U-Haul truck. So that that's pretty cool. I, I, I love that. They're definitely a well-loved species. Um, so I think in hearing that we will conclude and thank you all um, for being a part of this. And thank you to everyone who was on all three of the Venus Flytrap series or on two or on just today's. Um, thank you so much. This has been wonderful. And I think today was a great one because we were able to take some of those some of those items that we can really act on um, and think about, OK, what can we do? So now that we've gotten all this great information, how can we act on this? And I know we had we had put a few links in the chat, but the Venus Flytrap Champions dot org, Venus Flytrap Champions dot org is a great site to just be able to see some of these some of these topics that we are covering here and the license plate link is in the chat. Um, so we will definitely send a recording of today's webinar and if you miss any of the previous ones um, we'll definitely be able to send those over as well and we're getting a lot of thank yous in the chat so thank you Jeff, Scott, Leslie and Julie for speaking today and for the whole series um, this has been wonderful. Is there anything extra you want to add Julie? Yep. Yes that the North Carolina chapter of the Wildlife Federation has stepped up for this series. Thank you so much and Tara the fact that you can make it all work is even better. Most of us can talk, but a lot of us can't talk and manipulate the machinery at the same time. So it's been a great working with you and I hope we can do other things as time progresses, uh, up, updates on what we've been doing with this project. Thank you. Perfect, thank, thank you, absolutely, Julie. Um, so thank you all for being a part of the call and I hope you have a wonderful day and enjoy the nice weather. All right, thanks. Thanks, Tara. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, thanks all. all. <laughs> Thanks, Leslie. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs>